This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Adair Turner, who, uh, from how I say, many different dimensions, has been an enormous supporter and illuminator of INET and INET's agenda. Adair was, has been our board chair. He was the keynote speaker at our first conference in Cambridge, England in 2010 April. He's been the head of the Commission on Global Economic Transformations Energy Subcommittee, and he's a leading member uh, of that entire uh, endeavor that's co-chaired by Michael Spence and Joe Stiglitz. The Energy Transition Commission, based in England, of which Adair is the chair, is really at the vanguard of working both with public and private institutions and trying to accelerate the progress we make in both the global north and global south with regard to energy transition. Adair, thanks for joining me today. This uh, is a very, very interesting and critical time. India has been at the head of the G20 and has a meeting coming up. And I wanted to reach out to you for your guidance is where where is the world going and where would you like to see it go, particularly <laughs> as it pertains to energy? Well, Rob, it's great to be uh, uh, talking again uh, within the auspices of uh, INET and the, the Global Commission on uh, Economic Transformation, these crucial issues across the world, uh, multifaceted of what one is the energy transition uh, which we need to achieve. I think if you step back at the global level, uh, our perspective is that we really do have an extraordinary mix of really terrifying challenges, a lack of progress in some areas, but startlingly good progress in the others. And I think that sets a context to think about what the world needs to do, uh, what uh, developing countries like India need to do, and what India needs to do in its role at the G20. So. The challenge is that we're running out of time. We are continuing to put up there a, a CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions at a pace which is not yet actually coming down. We've committed to bring it down, but it's not yet coming down. We are eating through the remaining budget uh, of what the scientists tell us we can put up there in the atmosphere and still limit global warming to, say, 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees centigrade. And we're running out of time. I think we are seeing already around the world today the impact of global warming at 1.2 degrees centigrade. We're seeing that in you know, huge wildfires in Europe this year, enormous floods uh, in uh, China, in northern China. Uh, last year, we had amazing uh, floods and heat waves uh, in India as well. At 1.2 degrees, we are seeing the imprint of climate change. Frankly, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to limit it to 1.5 degrees, given the trajectory that we're now on. And it just takes time to shift around the super tanker of the global energy system. And if it goes significantly below 1.5 degrees to 1.7, 1.9 or even over two, I think you have to realize that the effects on the global welfare uh, will be catastrophic and they will be most catastrophic uh, in the global south, um, simply because, one, a lot of the climate effects will be greatest and most difficult to deal with there. Uh, and secondly, because poorer countries have less capacity to spend money on adaptation. So we face a hugely serious uh, challenge and we are not shifting away from fossil fuels uh, to new technologies fast enough. But here's the good news. The technological progress is absolutely remarkable. Uh, I've been extensively involved in issues relating to climate change for 15 years now. Uh, that's since I first became in 2008 the first chair of the UK Climate Change Committee, committed to driving the UK to net zero emissions by 2050. And in that time, I have seen the development of technologies far faster than I dreamed was likely to occur. So the cost of producing electricity from solar PV, solar photovoltaics, has come down about 90 percent. Uh, the cost of wind power has come down very significantly. The cost of batteries, uh, either to be used in electric vehicles 
or to be used as a storage device is down 85, 90%. In the last year, with all the interruptions we've had to supply chains in COVID, to the Russia-Ukraine war, to the increase in interest rates for the first time uh, in the major developed countries, there's been a, a, a flattening out of that trend of declining costs. But we are absolutely confident in my Energy Transition Commission that the trend is still there and that that cost or that trend of declining cost of batteries, of uh, electricity produced from solar, from wind, and also key other technologies such as electrolyzers uh, to make green hydrogen, that those are going to go on. So you have to live, I have to live in my own personal life as I engage in these debates with this sort of a uh, split personality. I can get up really depressed about the fact that we haven't yet turned the corner on emissions and just how bad it could be, but very aware of these technological possibilities. So we now see that certain technologies, solar PV, uh, heat pumps, uh, heat pumps and air conditioners, a very uh, crucial technology, uh, electrolyzers are progressing as fast as we need to build a zero carbon global economy by 2050. Uh, and we need to make sure that that pace is maintained, uh, drive it as fast as possible. But we then also need to fill in some of the things that aren't going fast enough. Let me give you a, a real uh, a specific example of that. In many parts of the world, the deployment of wind and solar is held, uh, is held up by the fact that we aren't investing enough in grids, in transmission grids, electricity networks. And the crucial point here is that sometimes requires government roles to make it happen. Uh, government roles, because grids are typically run by nationalized, publicly owned uh, companies. So you can end up with a situation where private enterprise is out there building lots of solar PV factories, lots of battery factories, but we don't have the grids to connect the solar PV. So that's part of the background. And I think the challenge is we have just got to accelerate the, pro pro the, the, the pace at which we grasp the possibility of some technologies which are transformational. Uh, and India is playing a major role in that domestically. Uh, India is very clear. It knows that it is one of the cheapest places in the world to produce solar PV electricity. It has new programs in place uh, to drive the electrification of road transport, uh, which will not only reduce uh, a, a, a CO2 emissions, but also will pr a contribute hugely to local air quality with huge uh, benefits for the health of individuals when you clean up uh, city air. Um, so India is playing uh, a quite a major role and many major Indian companies as well as the government are playing a major role. And India is an interesting com country because, you know, it is an intermediate. It is a lower, lower middle income country, but within it, you know, huge numbers of incredibly uh, highly skilled people and companies. You know, it has world class companies within a lower middle income country. It has large amounts of domestic savings uh, and investment. It's in a very different position from say uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where we just don't have those companies or that mobilization of capital. So the big picture, we're not going fast enough, but the technologies, many of the technologies are there to enable us to. How do we as a world, country by country and in cooperation, drive the pace of change faster than we are achieving at the moment. Yeah, I know, uh, Adair, I, I want to share with our audience that uh, in working with you really for almost 15 years, you were very prescient in seeing that the renewables costs were going down, work we did together in China and other things earlier on. And so I... I think it's very credible what you're saying. I don't think this is, a, I say, an optimistic dream. But it sounds as if what we have is a very fast racehorse that we've discovered, but we don't have a saddle and we haven't learned to ride yet. And so we don't know if we can win the race, but the potential of that horse to win the race is there. What I think uh, 
is very interesting now is the amount of energy that I'm seeing from the scholarly communities and the policy communities, whether it be Al Gore or Larry Summers or uh, our friend Arminio Fraga and others, that the need to understand that much of what is happening is is what economists would call a public good. Yeah. That it that the which am I call the magnets and the incentives of private finance alone may not be sufficient, yeah. and the need now, as people like John Kerry and Larry Summers and others have emphasized, for multilateral institutions to be turbocharged, to be stepping up, to be catalytic, particularly in those regions of the global south like uh, sub-Saharan Africa, but in many places. When you're making the world safer for everyone, you're providing public goods. And the market's incentives alone aren't going to, aren't going to do that. But the awareness of the jeopardy upon which, how I say, we're all subject to may create an impetus. How do, how do we go from seeing that it's a public good to realizing the capital flows that we need? Well, let's, I think it's really important to talk about the finance which is required to drive this transformation. And the International Energy Agency, uh, based in Paris, has, does a fantastic job at setting out the big fig, uh, figures. So, broadly speaking, we're heading in the right direction, but we're heading too slowly. Um, at the moment, a couple of years ago, we were investing as a world about two trillion a year in the energy system of the world. About a trillion was still going into the old economy of the fossil fuel system. Coal mines, coal fired power stations, a, uh, 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 oil fields, gas fields, gas fired power stations, etc. But a trillion was going into the economy of the future renewables, nuclear, grids, electric vehicle factories, etc. The good news is uh, that that new bit over the last three or four years has already gone up from about a trillion to about 1.7 trillion. So the ratio of the new to the old has gone up from one to one to 1.7. But when you run it forward over the next 30 years, what have we got to do? That ratio of new investment to old investment has got to go from 1.7 to 4 to 10 to pretty much infinite <laughs> as we expand the new investment and then reduce the investment in the fossil fuel system. And order of magnitude, and most people end up with this order of magnitude uh, figures, you end up saying that by the 2030 or thereabouts, the world will need to be investing, say, 3.5 trillion dollars a year in the new energy system in order to be in all the countries of the world going fast enough that we can get to around net zero emissions across the world by mid-century. Um, countries like the UK, uh, Germany, uh, uh, US have set targets of 2050 to get to net zero or in some cases earlier. China has set 2060, but I think we'll get 95% of the way there by 2050. Uh, India has set 2070, but I certainly hope we'll get most of the way there uh, during by the 2050s. To do that, we need to be at about $3.5 trillion a year of investment by uh, 2030. Now, the step up which has occurred so far from 1 trillion to 1.7 trillion has been primarily in China, where we are seeing extraordinary rollout of, for instance, uh, solar PV, just on an astronomical scale, stepping up in the US, stepping up in Europe, but so far not big enough in other countries of the world. And when we've run the figures and other people have run the figures, by 2030 uh, uh, or so, if it has to go from 1.7 to 3.5, which is a rough doubling, within that, we need slightly less than doubling, maybe an increase of 50% in China, the US and Europe, but we need increases of four times in middle income countries, lower middle income countries, and in low uh, income countries. 
We need a very big mobilization of capital. And the crucial thing then is where is this kind of capital going to come from and at what cost will it be mobilized? The cost of capital is hugely important when you're building a new renewable energy system. Because the new system which we're building, and this is true whether it's renewables or whether it's nuclear or whether it's a big hydro plant, they're all low emission uh, forms of producing electricity. They all have this feature. There is almost no operating cost. All that matters is building the asset up front. You have a set of assets which are basically large capital investment up front, close to zero marginal cost of operating them. Different from a fossil fuel uh, plant, uh, like a, a coal uh, generating plant, which has a capital asset, but there's also a lot of ongoing uh, operational cost to buy the coal to burn in it. And what that means when you think about it is that if you have an energy system whose structural characteristic is lots of upfront cost, very low marginal cost, the cost of capital becomes crucial. The economics of the annualized average total cost of operation depend crucially on whether that initial capital uh, was available at 4% real or 10% real or 20% real. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in sub-Saharan Africa recently looking at the economics there. And here's the challenge. If in sub-Saharan Africa you could do solar PV or wind developments at the same cost of capital that applies in Europe, you'd hardly build any fossil fuel plants at all. You would build wind and solar right from the beginning. You'd, you'd just skip a generation and build an electricity system. But if the cost of capital isn't, say, 4% real, but 10% real, it'll make sense to build some gas turbines cheaper to install up front, but more expensive to run. And if like in, you know, war-torn and troubled areas of Africa, the cost of capital at the best is 25% or more, you'll buy what's called a diesel genset, which is you know, a nice, cheap capital asset, even though you're going to spend a hell of a lot of money uh, on running it uh, over time. The cost of capital is really crucial. We have a structural change that we have to do where the relative cost of capital is crucial. And of course, what we have across the world is the cost of capital varies hugely country by country. It varies according to risk. It varies according to the scale of the development of the domestic savings pool. Um, you know, India, as I mentioned earlier, it does have a large domestic savings pool. It actually has quite a high savings rate. Uh, it has an increasing uh, middle class uh, who have significant savings. So it has a significant ability to uh, mobilize domestic savings. You go to sub-Saharan Africa, there's very little ability to, uh, a, or to a mobilize domestic savings. But even in India, the cost of capital is still significantly higher than it is in Europe. So We've got to achieve these very big flows of capital, and we've got to make sure that they are there at an affordable cost of capital. And that isn't automatically happening uh, through an entirely private sector operation, and, and it won't. And that is the role of multilateral development banks. I mean, if you, you ask, why did we ever create development banks in the first place, even before we were worried about climate change and an energy transition, we invented them to help mobilize flows of capital on a scale and at a cost in order to achieve public goods, either national public goods or global public goods, which would not be achieved by the private market alone. And that is why this issue of multilateral development bank and other official financial institution reforms has become hugely important. And there's a very important uh, report which was produced for the G20, uh, jointly chaired by uh, N.K. Singh uh, from yes. uh, India and Larry Summers. And as you said, Rob, uh, our friend Arminio Afraga uh, from Brazil, uh, also on that report. And I think they have 
built on previous reports, for instance, the one by Nick Stern and Vera Songwe, uh, which was launched at uh, COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. Yeah. And all of them basically say the same thing. We have got to increase the resources of the multilateral development banks, of which, of course, the biggest by far is the World Bank. We have got to have capital increases. We have got to enable them to sweat their balance sheets more and run at a higher level of leverage. We have got to enable them to do more leverage at the project level by taking more risk, by willing to get into, by being willing to provide uh, guarantees, rather than just loans. And we've got to pivot an increasing percentage of all their investment has got to go into helping the countries that need it to supplement their domestic uh, savings capability to achieve the scale of investment we need to go at the pace we need to grasp this opportunity of the new technologies which are now available. Let me, uh, this, this is very, very illuminating, but I, I want to, how do I say, weave it into our current experience. I see people in North America getting very scared now about the ramifications of climate change. When we're talking about funding multilateral institutions, a lot of people, say friends of mine from growing up in Detroit, think that's kind of a do-gooder fantasy because their kid's school system doesn't have enough money. The community colleges have withered. All, in other words, the opportunity cost of capital allocation. But are we not, if you will, it's, it's a awkward way of saying it, but are we not receiving a gift from the warning signs in the climate now to help us redirect the capital through multilateral institutions to those places like the global south? I know you and I've worked with the members of CJIT, the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, and have studied the huge demographic buildup of population in Africa and with all of the angst around the world about outward migration, there's another positive externality by building the proper infrastructure, maybe even education and technological infrastructure in addition to environmental, to help Africa develop in a way so that the adverse side effects of desperate mig outward migration are limited. So, uh, but, the, but the punchline I'm really coming at is, Aren't the warning signs now getting so vivid that we might be able to motivate capital allocation to the public good? Well, let me make a number of points on that, Rob. I mean, first, I think, you know, clearly we do have a challenge across the world now. And, and it's a challenge that's been made worse by some of the trends in uh, the internal economics and uh, social structure of the developed countries on which INES has focused a lot. So we are uh, asking uh, the, you know, the, the taxpayers of rich developed countries to contribute, uh, as I absolutely think they should contribute, to a global public good. And if you were to go to, if I was in India or Africa, I know part of the argument they would say is, look, you guys uh, were responsible for the lion's share of the accumulated emissions so far. So on the basis of justice, you, you ought to at least help us do it. Of course, we've got to do most of it ourselves. I mean, you know, foreign aid is, is, is never anything more than an assistance to you know, efforts which are primarily uh, domestic and should be. But there is a justice argument. Now, what, of course, we have in the rich developed world is, um, you know, a, a lot of people who feel that their own societies have become very unjust and uh, uh, unequal, uh, and their employment has become fragile, and they're worried about their healthcare systems. And so they basically say, well, I am not part of this elite that caused the problem. I don't feel part of this supposedly privileged group because I feel underprivileged in my own society. And so I'm not willing to support it. Now, we have to try to win that argument. It does say that, you know, in order to have the ability to win the arguments in developed countries that we should play our role in the global public goods, it would help if we were more equal and more equitable societies at home. It would be more easy to make that argument. So that's point one. Uh, point two, however, is that the global public good argument, I think, is hugely important. 
I think it is probably easier to make in Europe than the US. Uh, the argument you make about uncontrolled migration, because Europe you know, just sits immediately to the north of this huge expanding demography in Africa, um, it is in any case exposed to you know, uncontrolled uh, illegal uh, migration on a scale which tends to produce a public backlash. Um, that is a problem there in any case, but it will be multiplied a lot by the impact of climate change, because if climate change comes along and desertifies regions which were previously supporting food production, if it undermines economic development as it will, that, you know, that process of uncontrolled migration uh, will become even faster. Less so, less of an argument in the US. I mean, the US, the, the demography of South America is actually turning North American. I mean, the South America's population will soon stop uh, growing. It has fertility rates already below two uh, in most uh, countries. And people can't get in boats uh, off the north coast of Africa and, you know, land in East Coast America. That's not doable, but they can across the Atlantic. So certainly in Europe, it's an argument which I deploy, which is to say, guys, look, if we don't do something about climate change, we will own this problem one way or another. You know, it's going to make a, a set of challenges uh, worse. Um, the final thing to say, though, is I think one on the multilateral development bank point is, this has huge leverage. One of the things that we always have to remember, and it goes back to some of the economic theory that we've explored at INET, Rob, is that banks create spending power. They create spending power that didn't exist. The process of credit expansion creates spending power that already exists. And when you put capital into a, uh, a, 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 a bank like the World Bank, what it enables to do in terms of money lent to support grid developments in India or solar farms in Africa or uh, you know, new shipping lanes uh, burning ammonia rather than heavy fuel oil, whatever it is, you get this huge multiplier of the actual capital put in. Uh, and, and there are many layers of this multiplier. What you actually do with the World Bank is you commit that you would be willing to put in capital, but you don't necessarily have to pay it in as cash. You have a committed call, callable capital, and then that is leveraged. And when you look at it, actually, you know, when you're talking about not grant aid, grant aid is needed for the lowest income countries. There will have to be pure grants, and that is a bit expensive. But when you're talking about contributions to capital to increase the ability of the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks to mobilize capital, the sums of money are really very trivial in terms of the fiscal budgets of the rich developed world. So I think the crucial thing to say is this particular issue of mobilizing capital through uh, the development banks is just a very highly leveraged, highly effective use of public money. And we must be able to win uh, that argument. These are not big sums of money in terms of what it implies for you know, taxation levels in rich developed countries. And insofar as it helps support a sustainable growth rate across the world because there is a you know there is an externality benefit of when one country is growing sustainably it's enabling sustainable growth elsewhere it really is something that pays for itself so this ought to be an argument that we can win and i also sense uh, i have a son who works in technology venture capital and so forth that when you have that burst of energy associated with capital, say for climate transformation, the venture capitalists start to surround it and look for, with an E, complementary ways to allocate capital. Because if the baseline is moving, yeah. the profitability expectations of all kinds of other associated yeah. technologies and implementations warrants pure yeah. private capital. That, that is another layer of the, the leverage. It's you, you yes. put in the capital, um, you leverage up, 
Uh, you provide guarantees and then you mobilize private capital, which flows in because the multilateral capital is there. And, and mm -hmm. this is the great trick. It's the great, you know, it's what development banks do when they do it well. And we just need to do it, them do it you know, <laughs> better and bigger. Uh, but you know, it's, this yeah. isn't new. This, this is in our concept of what development banks do going back for decades. But yes. we realize that we have a challenge that requires it to happen on a, a much bigger scale uh, and, and better and more focused than it has been in the past. Yeah. Well, let's let's turn the corner a little bit here. The G20 is centered in India. And I think uh, many people, including my former neighbor and wise financier Ray Dalio, are talking about the importance of India. People are quite anxious about U.S.-China developments in recent years and in, in recent months. But the question now, India is coming to the end of its G20 leadership. It's been emphasizing Global South. It's been in emphasizing uh, climate transformation. But as they come to the conclusion of their leadership and pass the baton to Brazil, what do you recommend India say about the world that's, how would I say, unique to India? And what do we, what do we see within this very large and important country that you would want to underscore at this point in time? Well, I think you have to start with a number of points about India. First of all, uh, as it happens, I think India is one of the most vulnerable places in the world to climate change. I think, you know, with an increasing warming of the world, bits of the North Indian plain will become pretty much unlivable for anybody who is rich enough to avoid to afford uh, air conditioning. Um, now, we look that more of them will become rich enough to uh, afford air conditioning. But right at the moment that there is a huge uh, challenge a huge challenge to the nature of the monsoon uh, can get uh, a, a changed by climate change, etc. Secondly, uh, India is already a major player in some of the crucial technologies. It is rolling out solar photovoltaics fast, not as fast as China yet, and it needs to up the speed, but it is doing that. It is building uh, domestic supply chains, which makes sense for it to do. And of course, India has... Um, the, you know, very significant numbers of, of major domestic corporations, corporations which are absolute cutting edge in terms of their uh, technologies. You know, companies like uh, Mahindra, uh, Adani, uh, Reliance, uh, Renew Power, uh, Tata. You know, if you look, all, you know, I could rain many, many more who are, whether it be in batteries or uh, renewable uh, electricity or hydrogen electrolysis, you know, are, are mobilizing capital uh, and, you know, really pushing it into major opportunities. And uh, India has a major opportunity uh, in, in, in hydrogen. It has identified hydrogen uh, as a crucial area to uh, drive uh, forward. So, uh, you know, India is, of course, is a very big economy. Uh, it will be the biggest by population country uh, in the world, but it, it is already, and it'll be significantly bigger than China uh, by 2050. And it is an economy growing at about 5% per annum. And the great thing about 5% per annum is, you know, you can, you can argue, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be at 7%, but at 5%, Somebody once said compound interest is a remarkable thing. You know, it seems to start slow, but if you keep it going for 30 years, my God, it makes you, it makes you big. So as long as India can keep going, and I think it, it, it can with its technological capabilities and its corporate capabilities, it will become, you know, uh, one of the biggest economies uh, in uh, the world. So it is crucially uh, important. It is crucially important, therefore, that it both drives a decarbonization at the home, it, you know, at, at home. And the, the most important issue there is decarbonizing the power system and moving beyond coal. But it is also, I think, important that it provides an example in India to the rest of the developing world, which says, yes, we can do this. Uh, yes, we can work out by mobilizing capital enough. We, we can uh, we can work out how to decarbonize our economy and how to combine rising prosperity 
rising use of energy and electricity with decarbonization. So our scenarios for the growth of uh, Indian electricity system assume that by 2050, it will be, it will be consuming five to six times as much electricity as it does at the moment in order that all Indians can have electricity supply and increasing uh, electricity supply. So the story has to be one of growth. And I think what India can do, I think if India combined domestically a very strong commitment to green growth and a confident commitment to saying, we now recognize that there are technologies which are available, which as long as we require them to be deployed and support them to be deployed and gradually get rid of the old technologies can drive a green sustainable growth path. If India does that domestically, but then is a big engager in the world of saying, and that should be our, our vision globally, right? Our vision globally should be how to move beyond coal in power systems as soon as possible, how to mobilize capital to the places that have the opportunity to skip a generation. I, I think India could be, you know, a, a really major player in these debates. Now, I happen to think, and I hope this won't uh, be too provocative for Indian co colleagues, that it would be good if they had a 2060 target, not a 2070 target. I think 2060 is for net zero is easily technologically achievable for a country uh, with India's capabilities. And I think there are many people, not just in developed countries, but even more in other developing countries who look at India and say, well, oh, why did they fit 2070 as their net zero date? Vietnam set 2050, Indonesia set 2060, Kenya set 2050. So there is a sort of, why is India a bit of an outlier? My actual belief is that with the great capabilities of their companies and their technologists and their skills, they, they will get there most of the way earlier, but actually making a commitment that they will and saying that's the target and we're going to do 2060. At the Energy Transition Commission, we believe that the whole of the rich developed countries should get to net zero by 2050 at the latest and ideally earlier, uh, and all developing countries should get there by 2060. That's what we think has to occur. So mm -hmm. I know that's a bit provocative, but within the context of India, confidently stepping forward and say, yes, we can do this. Here is this vision of India, a deeply electrified society, using its amazing sources of uh, electricity, uh, you know, solar electricity. And then one final thought, I think India, and India has been a, a leader in this, uh, India should be a leader in getting on our agenda the idea of some of the international linkages in electricity systems. When I was first chair of the uh, Energy Transition Commission, my co-chair from the Energy uh, a, a, and Resources Institute of uh, India, Terry, uh, was RJ Mathur, the then uh, director general of that. He left to become the secretary general of the International Solar Alliance. Uh, they are working on links, international links. For instance, links from the Middle East to a, uh, India, which would enable India uh, to be uh, producing electricity for its needs during the day, but then drawing on Middle Eastern desert uh, electricity in order to keep the air conditioners running into the evening when the Indian sun has gone down. There are people who I know who are uh, uh, trying to develop a huge wind and solar farms in Morocco, uh, which will be able to produce electricity shipped to the UK by 4,000 kilometer HVDC lines, um, which will be available for the UK when the wind goes down uh, in the North Sea, as it sometimes does in the middle of winter, just when we use a lot of electricity. Now, actually, Premier Modi is one of the people who in the past has talked about uh, one world, one grid, uh, one uh, one sun, uh, Osawog, uh, one sun, one world, one grid, uh, <laughs> bringing together uh, the world into an electricity grid. Uh, that, I think, is something that India uh, you know, could talk about uh, uh, as well and is, I think, something that we do need on agenda. And, I, you know, I think my final thought is 
And it goes back to what I said right at the beginning, Rob. We need to be aware that we are in a very scary place and we are running out of time and we could do catastrophic harm to human welfare, probably most of all in the lower and lower middle income countries of the world, which India is still part of one. But we've got to balance that with a sense of vision and an optimism that we now have a set of technologies and possibilities which enable us to have net zero economies by mid-century, which are not only the solution to climate change or the limiter to climate change, but also will create just much more attractive cities in which to live, much cleaner air, uh, which will create jobs, etc. So I think I would encourage India to make sure that they are t- developing that optimistic story and encouraging all the countries of G20 to commit to that optimistic story, commit to stretching targets, commit to rolling out renewables faster than it is uh, at the moment, confident that India knows it can become a, a clean, electrified, zero carbon economy while becoming more prosperous, and that that's the message that it wants to give to the rest of the world. Well, I think all of this, Adair, thank you. This is very, very um, illuminating and inspiring. I know Mike Spence, our uh, fellow on the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, has been doing a lot of work on digital, what you might call structure of society, and his uh, optimism, in part through work he's done with the Luhan Academy and Chen Long, Uh, when I've talked to him, he said, well, the natural place for that to accelerate is in India because the digital transition infrastructure, banking systems and everything are ahead of the curve, even relative to many places in the global north. So I think there is optimism for India as an example. And I think, as you say, the global leadership that India can inspire uh, it may not be fair to them because, as you say, in the north, we burned all the carbon. Yeah. But given where we are, they can play not just as the G20 leader in the next few months, but on an ongoing basis. They can be a leading and an, an inspiring example to help bootstrap that optimism that can become what you might call amplifying for the actions and the results throughout the world.